Sagar Doshi and Zach Hormoses, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you. Yeah. So you guys are both there with uh, with high end equipment. I was commenting earlier on your professional looking pop filters. So you, you guys are also in the podcast game. So I guess today we're going to be talk, talking about your contribution to helping the world become wise and sane about health. Yeah, our attempted mm -hmm. contribution. Still Very good. Always a work in progress. Just seeing places where we can help patients. Yeah. So why don't you guys start by Learn just more introducing and do yourselves? Sagar, you go first. All right. My name is Sagar Doshi. I'm a physician here in Columbus, Ohio. Emergency medicine is my original specialty. And then eh, we might discuss the story later, but I got into lifestyle medicine, got boarded in that, and now do both emergency medicine and lifestyle medicine here with Zach. And in addition to opening up a clinic together and seeing patients, we also started a podcast to try and bring out some really good practical information on how much control people have over their lives. Nice. When, when, you, when you said that, I, I, right I heard now. mercy medicine instead of emergency medicine. I was wondering, like, that's, that sounds like a really neat specialty. Sometimes. <laughs> that's more, yeah. that's more the realm of well, hospice. We, we all, we all need care. mercy. But... <laughs> But sometimes it's uh, anyway. So emer ER, we do e uh, emergency medicine, and lifestyle medicine. And Zach, how about you? Uh, my really my credentials aren't a whole lot different, except that I'm just not boarded. I uh, studied lifestyle medicine with Sagar a bit, but uh, yeah, started as an emergency physician. Um, started getting interested in lifestyle medicine because of the changes it could make, uh, and then yeah, jumped on with Sagar to do our our clinic and podcast, and now here we are. Gotcha. And were you guys doing the lifestyle medicine thing independently or did one of you drag the other one along? Yeah. Yeah. The latter. Well, no, not a drag, but when we realized we both wanted to do the same thing, it triggered us to just say, mm -hmm. okay, let's just do it then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There was so one common used to work in the that... same group in the ER. We used to work in the same ER. And one of the, one of the hospitals we're at is a really busy hospital with a lot of, you know, a lot of sick patients come through the door there. We were having a relatively atrocious day where it was just busy. We were both getting beat up and I came back to my desk and I'm soccer was already sitting there and I look at him I'm like, man, this, this switch into lifestyle medicine is looking better and better every day. <sighs> and he didn't really say a whole lot then, but then the next day he was, I think you texted me. You were like, you, are you serious about, about that <laughs> lifestyle medicine clinic? And I was like, yeah, kind of. I mean, my wife and I had toyed around with the idea. She's an internal medicine doc and uh, she's, kind of the one she's the one who dragged me into lifestyle medicine uh and then i was like yeah i kind of yeah so the four of us uh the husbands and wives sat down together and painted this plan to develop a lifestyle medicine clinic that's kind of turned into what it is today yeah i was just <laughs> really shocked to hear anybody else talking about that i thought i was the only one mm. so when when, when <laughs> you're having an atrocious day in the er I, you know, I'm a mat, you know, I watch TV shows, right? So I know it's all about, you know, gunshots and helicopter explosions and. <laughs> yes, that's exactly it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Sometimes there are bombs lodged inside of people. Right. No, like, so like, what's, yeah. what's the link between, you know, being in the emergency room and thinking, you know, maybe there's an upstream here. Like, what, what are you actually seeing on an atrocious day? And what, what does it make you think about? So just to paint this picture, just what is it like a 50 bed emergency department? It's the second busiest in the state of Ohio is where we were at that time. And so when somebody super sick comes in, they come in as an alert of some kind. A sepsis alert means somebody has suspicion of having widespread infection, a stroke alert. We're suspecting that they have a stroke heart attack alert or a STEMI alert. We're pretty sure this guy has a heart attack that needs to go something very urgent. A lot of urgent things need to happen all at once. So an atrocious day in that ED is alert. Everyone gets pulled away from what they're doing to go to this patient. Alert, leave that patient to go to a new patient. Alert, leave that patient to go to a new patient. Please mm -hmm. do this simultaneously without dropping any balls. So that's yeah, an atrocious. It's not and that kind uncommon of that that day, happens. Actually. I don't remember why this day was particularly seemed like it was more burdensome than most. Uh, but I do remember coming back to my desk and just being like, man, like what is going on right now? Uh, which isn't all that common that I feel like I'm getting stretched really thin, but sometimes it just happens. Uh -huh. Oh, this is well before COVID. Yeah. This was pre COVID. Right. But what, what sorts of things? Of yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. And so I saw a guy. I saw a guy that came in, super nice guy, 
And he came in and he said, he's grabbing his chest and said, Doc, I'm having a heart attack. And I thought, yeah, you might be, but you know, there's 15 other things it could be. He said, no, uh -huh. this is my 13th one. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and he handed me a binder. And inside this binder was just a beautiful layout of all of his prescription medications and all the procedures he's had. And oh my gosh, how many stents there are. And so got his EKG, boom, giant heart attack. And yeah, off to the catheterization lab he went. And I went back to my desk going, 13? <laughs> how do you get to 13? Do something. Do something different. And that, that was uh, unfortunately right around the time that I lost my father, the complications mm -hmm. of diabetes. And that just really sparked the the flame of do something different. What is happening? Something needs to change. And through exploration and looking at a nutrition and finding different authors and um, specialists found this entire world of lifestyle medicine, which is a real board of medicine that you need to go take a board exam to pass to call yourself boarded. Um, so it's legitimate is my point in all that. And I didn't realize it was out there and I didn't realize that there was a century's worth of data um, good data, but on as, these as, a, as a boarded subspecial, I guess it's a subspecialty of 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 family medicine or internal medicine, or so its own deal. You know, like most it's its own most deal. of those, like yeah. aren't controversial, right? Like you could do a cardiology or you could do nephrology, and no one's like, "Oh, that's not real." But like, <laughs> isn't isn't there kind of a stigma <laughs> that like like you know you have to go and and go off you know, out of the box to find the books like you're reading books that are in, you know, Barnes and Noble and Amazon as opposed to textbooks. Like how did, how did, how did you, well, what, what, what is the resistance to like all of medicine saying, Hey, lifestyle should really be the first thing we think about. Yeah. And I'll just uh, push back a little bit. There are general textbooks <laughs> right now holding up the laptop. So it's at the right angle is okay. a lifestyle <laughs> medicine textbook that is roughly this thick. <laughs> and I've got a lot more on my bookshelf, but yeah, Zach, what do you think is the biggest I mean, resistance or the, I think the just medicine in general, we're taught, I mean, it's pharmaceutical based, it's procedure based. We learn things that are designed to prevent problems that we've already identified. Um, and one of those problems typically is not an epidemiologic study of looking at what kills the most people and how to prevent that, but it's usually, okay, you have blood pressure, how to prevent the secondary step of you giving a heart attack mm -hmm. and it's just the medical teaching i don't think it's necessarily designed um with with any malice it's just the way that medicine is taught in med school and we learn so much stuff and the developments for all of these all of these new technologies and new procedures are so it's so robust all of the evidence and the research that goes into that that i don't think people stop and think hey there's probably something really simple that we can do and then you start getting into you know, what, what exactly is the right lifestyle change as far as dietary stuff. And there's a bunch of theories with minimal evidence for the opposing viewpoints to what is traditionally taught in lifestyle medicine, in my opinion and research. Uh, but then even if you can establish that that's something that's legitimate, that should be taught how it should be taught, then is this whole other, other issue where there's no big group of pharmaceutical companies or, you know, dietary groups and, you know, big meat or whoever, with a bunch of money to shove into it to say that this is the way it should be done. So there's a lot more of a, of a toss up for who should be leading the way here. If that makes sense. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and some of it is not controversial whatsoever. If you look at the basis of family practice, internal medicine, pediatrics, even general surgery, everyone, whenever, as you brought up that example of blood pressure, any, somebody sometimes uh, they come in with the blood pressure problem. They come in with high cholesterol issues. The first step that we always learn, is lifestyle change. But mm -hmm. at least in learning it and in practice, that's where we leave it. Lifestyle change. What mm -hmm. does that mean? No, no, no. We're on to something else now. <laughs> Don't worry. Your patient won't be able to handle that or they won't be able to sustain that. There's a little bit of implicit, uh, I don't want to call it. Yeah. It's a little implicit bias that the thing that you want your patient to do, they're not going to do. So don't even bother with telling them to do it. Move mm -hmm. on to the thing they will do, which is pop this pill. But the lifestyle medicine, it's, it's in there. It is what you're supposed to do first. It's just, we kind of leave it there. At least in my training, we left it there and say, like, yeah, just tell them to eat right, do a lot of exercise. And we never delved further. We went into the other problems and medicine, I don't know, at least in this country kind of got built off infectious disease, I think. And how do we, um, stop that? 
right? And that is something that you can cure with pills a lot of the time or drips. You can cure an infectious mm. disease and you just need someone to show up when they get sick. And now we have to shift gears completely and try to get someone to show up before they get sick and realize <laughs> that this is when you need to do this. Well, so, I mean, it seems like there's also a, a different quality in terms of if you give someone a prescription, you would say, like, take 50 milligrams of this pill with food three times a day. There's a specificity there compared to lifestyle change. You know, you, you wouldn't just say to someone, hey, you should take pills. <laughs> right. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's true. some pills, some some amounts. Yeah, some sort you know, of I don't pills. really know, but <laughs> probably help. Right. But, but like, so like, did you, you know, yeah. I assume you learn how how to prescribe, and there's there's protocols and, and computer programs and, and education around that. Whereas prescribing th with that level of specificity around diet, I don't know that uh, many doctors are trained to do that. Yeah, but they can be, and definitely I got that from my training with lifestyle medicine. Is that you can do the same thing? You want someone to eat healthfully? All right, tell them. I want you to start here. Mm. This is your tablespoon of beans for the day. And next week I want two tablespoons. <laughs> then we're going to start talking a can a day. Okay. So we're going to take these steps one at a time. You tell them up front, all right, this is where we're trying to get to. This is your real prescription. And then break it down into mm. bite-sized bits <laughs> as long as we're talking about food. And the same thing for exercise, right? Exactly what kind of exercise do they need to do? How intense does it need to be? And how often do they need to do it? And what are they going to get from it? That's also important to mm. show people. Is, I think. Yeah, go ahead, Zach. Well, I think some of it also is difficult because you look at who sets the rules. So if you're in a primary care practice, if somebody's got an A1C of 7.5 or 8 or their blood pressure is X, Y, or Z, and you don't put them on blood pressure pills, all of a sudden you're getting your quality measures aren't being met and your quality measures a lot of times set by insurance companies or CMS, which is the center for Medicare and Medicaid services, where they say, you're not doing this. So your reimbursement rates are going to fall. And we need you to see this many patients and this number of them need to meet these metrics. And if you just say, Hey, listen, your blood pressure has been high the last four visits. Let's work on some things. We're going to work on some, some meditation, some deep breathing. We're going to get you exercising a bit. Uh, CMS is going that's all fine and good, but you didn't start them on a blood pressure medicine. And you're like, yeah, I know. I'm trying to get them down without blood pressure medicine. Yeah. Well, that doesn't, you don't meet our metrics, so you're falling out and your quality measures are going up. Right. So we're right. not going to pay you. Right. And so you so, can't pay so your So the staff. CMS is <laughs> looking not at outcome measures, but your procedures? Like They look at outcome measures, but it, it's based on what they view as the way to get to that outcome. So they look at your the path to get to the outcome that they desire. And even if you don't necessarily meet your outcomes, they go, okay, but you did the right path to get to the outcome. So that's good enough. Now there's the, the whole philosophy is you as the doctor are in control of this patient's health. And so you need to do these steps to take, to make these interventions that we've already deemed as the best interventions. Mm -hmm. And from a, from a, from a know, pill perspective, it may, the, the data <laughs> outcomes are better when you prescribe those medicines. That's true, but it just totally neglects trying something else lifestyle wise. So what's the downside of just the, the, the pills, if they work, if they give you that out, those outcomes. So we just talked about this actually. Um, and then we have a podcast coming out about this. So specifically, for example, in regard to hypertension, if you look at outcome measures among people who are well-controlled hypertension versus people who don't have hypertension at all, their outcomes are actually not that dissimilar. They don't do too badly, but the problem is you're looking at people who have hypertension are now on a pill, which side effects of pills, cost of those pills. Um, and then typically what their lifestyles are going to predispose them to needing more blood pressure pills. And then eventually they're probably going to need other stuff too, because, you know, they're eventually going to develop diabetes. There's just another study published recently that looked at the link between blood pressure and diabetes being kind of a comorbid condition, this metabolic syndrome we look at. So you've got now multiple things going on for which you're taking medications, which you're still predisposed as you progress through, through time. So, yeah, I mean, if the pills worked perfectly and everybody tolerated them and there were no issues with them and they were cheap and widely accessible and people followed up with their doctors, then sure, I guess we could do that. But the reality is that the whole of lifestyle medicine aims at just more than just a blood pressure target or just a, you know, blood sugar target. There's a whole wellness component of it 
that isn't really quantified by a single thing, a single data point. Mm. So for a, for a patient, they kind of get to make a cost benefit analysis, but right now they're not being told all the options, right? They're being told you have to be on this pill. And my understanding of for uh, blood pressure pills in particular is that they're pretty low compliant drugs. I guess people don't like a lot of the side effects. And so you can't even get people to do that, let alone, you know, eat broccoli. Oh, which is sad because a lot of the side effects for blood pressure medicines, they all have different side effects. So if instead of just not taking their medicine, they talk to their doctor about better side effect profiles for them and their medicines, they might be able to switch around and take it. But still, it's just really hard to take a pill multiple times mm -hmm. a day, every single day for the rest of your life. And so people, you're right, people don't do it so much. Sometimes it's only half as half wow. of people take their medicines appropriately. So you got, you mentioned the podcast. So t um, Zach, tell, tell me a little about the podcast. How did it start? Uh, you know, when we started the the clinic, we wanted to kind of reach out to people with, I don't want to call it generic advice, but advice that wasn't necessarily specific to their situation, but also try to get some of our our information and our research out and our thoughts out on, on lifestyle medicine. So Saga and I just basically started recording conversations uh, that we would, we would have some kind of data that we would talk about or some kind of research and we'd talk about it. And um, really what happens is one person has done the research specific to that group of time, so, or that period of time where we'll talk about, for example, hypertension. We both did research on certain components of hypertension as it pertains to most recent data. And then we talk about that and get each other's reactions to it. Uh, and we just talk and talk about anecdotes that we have and things that we've seen with our patients, um, and kind of try to give people a better way of living life that isn't so, okay, I know you have high blood pressure and this is your number. So this is what we're going to do with you. But say, if everybody does these things, the data show that it's pretty beneficial. Uh, mm -hmm. And then so many people don't even know what they have, right? Somebody tells them, by the way, in case anyone's listening, doesn't know hypertension is the same thing as high blood pressure, but people get told they have high blood pressure and that's about it. Sometimes it gets explained to them, but not in a way that they understand. There's, high blood pressure is lots of different things. There's a lot of different causes. And unfortunately, it all comes back to physics, which is, can be very understandable if you put it that way. But we were noticing a lot of people coming through, at least in the clinic and in the emergency department, that didn't really understand the, what blood pressure <laughs> means and that it's not simply a lack of medication. So if you have someone that thinks that they have a medical condition caused by the lack of medication, we're doing something wrong so because <laughs> that's not how medical conditions occur that's not why they occur you weren't born supposed to be uh there weren't blood pressure medicines in the breast milk <laughs> of your mother and then suddenly you came off of them and there's been a slow increase ever since <laughs> there and thank goodness we gave you back some medications there are other things going on there are some causes and if we can understand why the blood pressure is going up then maybe people will say oh well, that makes sense. Okay, I will do what you're talking about mm. because I can and, understand. And I guess it if now. you're just if you're just giving someone a pill, there's no need for them to understand. That's my it. hope, anyway. There's no there's there's no there's no benefit if if they have no if they have no internal agency over. I don't know. Yeah, I still like to try and explain it to people. I find that people tend to do um, better with things when they understand think, exactly. why they're doing things. And I think that's true of most anything. I mean, when I'm in the emergency department, there's a new order set coming through for a protocol. My first reaction is, why do I have to do this? Why? Mm -hmm. Who's benefiting from this? And if you sit down and explain it to me like I'm a child, uh, <laughs> then I, I learn a little bit. I'm like, okay, that's fine. That's reasonable. Uh, but yeah, in general, if I know why, I'm, I'm much more likely to be uh, compliant with whatever the request is of me. And I don't know if this is uh, just our personalities, but there's a lot of, at least my initial reaction things, and I know this is Jack's yeah. initial reaction of many things. Is this, mm, yeah. that's BS. <laughs> no, prove it to me. That's BS. <laughs> My, uh -huh. my wife had to prove it to me. Bus. She's yeah. the one who put oh, down a bunch of papers me. in front of me and made me believe it. When I first, sure, when she first told me this, and I was like, "That's crazy. Uh, I don't have any likelihood of having heart disease. I don't need to do any of this stuff." And then uh, <laughs> she put down papers, and I was like, "Oh, this sucks. Now I have to deal with this and listen to it and actually do <laughs> what the papers say that I should do." Uh, yeah. Well, it's. I mean, <laughs> one, one of the reasons I really yeah, enjoy your podcast <laughs> is that attitude. That, you know, we, we live in such a, you know, dualistic world in which, you know, it's you're either this or that. And once you have your opinion, 
then you're going to die on it. Mm -hmm. right? That's it's really nice to you know, and and it's and it's just as true in the plant based vegan movement as it is you know in paleo or keto or carnivore or anywhere else that I just see you know we just keep looking at the same data and we ignore other data. And I really appreciate that you guys are just, it seems like you guys are just looking for what's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes that matches up with yeah. our preconceived like, well, notions. And sometimes well, like we were both, we were both equally like surprised in the rest of with, medicine. you know, the, <laughs> the point that we just mentioned earlier, that blood pressure that's well controlled, it has the same outcomes as people who don't have high blood pressure, that if you do have a diagnosis and it's well controlled, we were both like, really, that can't be right. And we looked at it and we're like, all right, I guess it is. That's strange. All right. I guess we got to, I guess we got to think of, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> we got to deal with this now. <laughs> right. Can't put this, can't put this on a t-shirt. Yeah. And then it comes back to a lot of, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> what you put on the t-shirt is, it depends. <laughs> Because that's what a lot of it is, right? It depends. If you are a super healthy 25-year-old athlete and your family history is full of very healthy athletes and everyone's not getting dementia and everyone's living long, eating the same stuff that you are now, you know what? You could probably eat whatever the heck your family has been eating. And if that's pepperoni mm -hmm. pizza, then, all right, I guess that's going to work out for you. <laughs> but on the other end, if you're talking about someone who's already had a heart attack or a stroke or suffering from other chronic conditions, uh, you got to put the brakes on and start going in reverse. So it really depends on what the situation is and what the condition so, is. If you guys are talking about, you know, reading study, like for your podcast, just reading up a bunch of studies and then talking about it, um, compare, compare the amount of research you have to do with like normal doctors. <laughs> like, <laughs> You know, like, do you do, do you have, do you do more to, you know, I, I mean, just, I'm not really sure. Like someone who's, you know, been practicing for 20, 30 years, are they constantly like reading five, six new papers a week? Like what's, what's, what's your experience of doing research in this, in, in, in lifestyle compared to other fields? I'll, I'll start it. You want to take that Zach? Cause, uh, and spin it in a way that you're right. So should, should, like we get, should we get her on the call life. too? She would have, she would be great on the call. Uh, <laughs> but um, I think right now, um, if you compare us to other people, basically we're relearning things that we weren't taught. So I would say in general, we're probably reading a lot more because we're basically learning a new specialty as mm. we go along here. It would be not dissimilar from, you know, somebody who's, you know, in family practice society and they want to start studying nephrology and they have to read and try to become an expert in that field all of a sudden. So I think that from that standpoint, we're probably doing a lot more reading. And then in general, I would guess that the answer would be a specialty specific. You know, if you're, if you're a, an electrophysiologist and you're doing pacemakers and all these strange, uh, or I shouldn't say strange, but these, uh, you know, new and upcoming devices that you're putting into people and the indications form, you're probably reading a lot more then somebody has been practicing in a rural area where patients don't have access to a lot of, uh, you know, different medications or they don't have great insurance coverage and you're basically going what's tried and true cheap medications to keep people out of the hospital. So I think a lot of that specialty specific, but I would assume that people who are more highly specialized are doing a little bit more, um, new and upcoming paper reading than, than others. Okay. Yeah. And I would, I mean, I would disagree with that based off nothing because I haven't got any data on this, but this is my opinion anyway, <laughs> which is, I think everybody is trying to learn and keep up, um, with everything, at least in our generation of docs and anyone close to us. I'd, I've definitely seen examples of people that have been in rural settings for many decades that eh, aren't up on the newest treatments and what you do need to do and not need to do. But <clears throat> in general, everyone's trying to stay up to date on top of the stuff consuming whatever kind of continuing medical education that they need to, um, which is usually, I think you know, if you add it up multiple papers a week, I think that's fair. I think what I, what I meant though, is as far as like new developing data, like if I'm, if I'm, you know, practicing in the emergency medicine, a lot of the stuff that we read about is throughput information that has nothing to do with new technologies or medications. It's how do I run my department to make sure the patients are quickly taken care of and effectively taken care of, not it, it, totally Regard, you know, not even considering medication usage or whatever. 
of course, we're still doing our stroke continuing medication, uh, CME and, uh, you know, STEMIs and surgical emergencies and things like that. But, uh, you know, if I'm looking at our, our rural population, it's okay, how do I get compliance? Or I shouldn't, may, I'm, maybe I shouldn't keep using the rural, but if I'm doing family practice, it's a lot of it is how am I getting compliance out of my patients? What techniques am I using? I don't care about the new, you know, bariatric surgery protocols. Mm-hmm. I don't care. It's not, it's not relevant to me. It's not what I do. Uh, so I, th- I think that's what I mean by that. Uh huh. So, so, I mean, one of the things I've been thinking about for a while, and maybe I'm just trying to justify my own existence is that the, the, the challenge of lifestyle medicine is prescri- is prescribing things that get done. And so, you know, help understanding like the cutting edge is like, like there's something very, very, um, conservative about lifestyle medicine in terms of, you know, since Hippocrates, right, we've sort of understood the like lifestyle and it's not, it's not necessarily new and flashy, like, you know, ooh, a better color of broccoli or something, you know, it's like very sort of low tech. <laughs> yeah. Broccoli Rob, right? Right? There's, there's, it's like very sort of low tech stuff. And it seems like the, you know, the, the real challenge is saying it in a way that people are going to change. And I'm wondering, you know, your, your response to that. Yeah. Or, you know, as I've learned from others like you, uh, listening in a way that lets people change as well and letting them, uh, make some of those crystallizations and realizations through their own thought process and through trial and error. But, it's not just saying the right thing in the right way. And I've been trying that for a long time. Had left a land. It hasn't really landed with most people. But uh. when they say the right thing in the right way to themselves, <laughs> that's where I could get some progress done. So what? So what's the practice like? Like you were talking about, you know, atrocious days in in the ER. What What does it look like now? Your your uh, your 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 day to day, like. Your, as far as the, mm-hmm. so we still work as well in the emergency department. I actually work in a rural yes. setting, so that might be why Zach keeps talking on that. So, but <laughs> <laughs> those are my patients. Those are my people now <clears throat> that I take care of. And so on those days, those are those days. That's the emergency department. And when it's appropriate and then there's time for it, try to break the ice and say, hey, have you ever considered, you know, these other ways? that you might be, you, you want to listen to this thing? Cause there's some other ways to approach this. And sometimes I hear yes. And sometimes I hear no. And then as far as clinic days, mm-hmm. we're actually all tele thanks to COVID. Now we gave up our office. And so now it's about seeing patients over the computer and doing the same thing that we would do in the office. Just nice long sessions, listening, talking, trying to figure out, all right, what's, do you know where you need to get to and why? Well, let's cover that. And then how are we going to get there? And that's, you know, actually kind of fun. And that's part of the, that's the fun. And that's the frustration all wrapped up into one gotcha. is that process. I'm, I'm, yeah. So, I mean, what, wh- what are some, do you have any, um, you know, happy stories about people in the ER who respond? Yes. And they want to change even in, in that sort of, you know, urgent situation. So I don't get to see people as much as my tiny community. Uh, I don't see them necessarily right away. So I don't have any success stories from the emergency department in my new community. But Zach, you've been working in the I mean, same the place. The only one that I can still for a number of years. Deal, I don't really get the chance to follow up with most of my patients, but I did have one patient who I, I think he came in for high blood pressure or something like that. And I talked to him about all of these things and forks over knives and lifestyle medicine and whole food mm-hmm. plant-based diets. And a couple of weeks later, I ran into his wife who told me that he's lost a bunch of weight and they've both been doing it and they both feel a whole lot better. And she's like, you're the, you're the vegan doctor, right? And I was like, yeah. I guess, I mean, I, I guess <laughs> that's not wrong. Uh, so that was at least kind of interesting to see somebody actually listen to what I say. Cause sometimes you just get the idea that you tell them and they're like, all oh, interested. Like, yeah, yeah, it sounds great. And they go home and they go back to doing what they were doing and nobody changes, which is, I understand. I think a lot of people are all excited mm-hmm. when you're in the ER and you're feeling something and you're there for a bad reason. And somebody gives you some options and you're like, this sounds great, but then actually going home and doing it is something totally different. Uh, but then actually hearing somebody doing it was kind of cool. Hmm. So you, met, you mentioned forks over knives. I'm real curious about how you use, 
documentaries like that. You know, there's there's been a whole bunch of them from you know what the health or game changers or and and they are not without their issues, right? In terms of they're not mm -hmm. they're not look they're not trying to do what you're doing in your podcast, right? They're they've got a a mission to to present a particular viewpoint and they are curating the data. How do you how do you use them? How do you think about them and talk about them with patients when you know they've got lots of great information? They're very motivating, and they might not be you know totally a hundred percent unbiased. Sagar, go ahead. Yeah. So the one I don't really tell people to watch mm -hmm. any documentaries except for Forks Over Knives. Uh, I feel like that one was a better, and I I premise it with. If you watch this, you're going to think it's all BS, but I, <laughs> because that's what I thought when I first watched this movie. And then I started doing research and going, oh, okay, this might be real. <laughs> and so I, I've warned them that about that process that they may go through. And that at the end of that, they need to come back, either talk to me or talk to somebody who's a physician, who's going to understand that perspective. And I try to refer them to the ACLM or the American College of Lifestyles Medicine's directory on lifestyle medicine doctors are out there. Because there's a bunch of people that who oh, may not, they may not be able to come back to me. I'm actually not allowed to tell them to come to me due to laws about <laughs> being a physician. Um, but they can find somebody else online and, and get care there. So they get interested. Maybe they do some changes, but then they're going back to somebody who can give them more unbiased data mm -hmm. and apply it, it to yeah, their I, actual yeah, life and conditions. Yeah, ahead, okay. I'll say I view it as a tool. Um, and you basically tell me yeah, there are a lot of cringy moments in those ones, especially what the health and uh, game changes. While I didn't mind those documentaries, there's points where you're just like, okay, like, yeah, the kid eating a big cigarette on his plate is probably not the best imagery to be like presenting yourself as an unbiased source of information here. Um, some of it tends to go a little <laughs> overboard to me, but at least forks over knives that information presented seems to be fairly legitimate. And again, not that the ones aren't, but that one's just basically like, Hey, look, this is the diet that I'm talking about. It may be tough for you, but this is an outline of what it looks like. And you can kind of use that as a jumping off point. Yeah. And unfortunately they don't, I have not seen the documentaries yet that are talking about movement and connection yeah. and coping skills, huh. and stress management. If it's out there. Tell me about it because I want to watch them. I want to have people watch them. But there That's seems to really be some documentaries from that genre. That's missing. really interesting. I never some thought holes about that. Holes that need to be filled. The, the, <laughs> the uncontroversial stuff doesn't get documentaries. Weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You it's know, all about it's like ratings, the, viewers. Right. We, our brains crave, you know, novelty or difference. Like if you, you know, if you, if you, if I see a headline that says bacon's good for me, I'll click on it. If I see a headline that says salad's good for me, I probably not click on it. I don't, you know, it doesn't add anything. So I wonder, like, yeah. And you would think movement, you would think exercise would yeah. be controversial the way people treat it because they're not doing it, <laughs> right? So you think there'd be a big controversy about it? Not so much the. Yes, I agree. I so, should be doing so, that. Well, that was very good for me. Yeah, go, I'm not sorry, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I was going to say the difference with exercise, I think everybody knows that they need to do it with diet. It's like, well, you know, there's this keto craze and there's this blah, blah, blah. Everybody's agreeing that they should exercise. The general reaction is, yeah, I guess I should exercise more. more. And there are many people that I meet that are like, yeah, you know, I should be eating more salad. Most of them are like, oh, they, they tell me bacon's good for me or butter's good for me. And I just want to, you're just slapping mm. yourself in the head listening to this stuff. <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, we, you know, we can have debates about, you know, eccentric exercise versus uh, plyometric. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, you know, maybe we need more controversy to get people. To... I think so. We, I think we do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna say, hit is the only way to exercise. I've done it now. <laughs> there are what no is, but equal to, ways. Tabata, do you do 2010 or 1515 or... <laughs> Which which one sucks? <laughs> uh, whatever makes you puke more, that's the one you should go for. <laughs> unless <laughs> unless you actually have some heart disease, in which case, please talk to your doctor. <laughs> then then that chest pain may not be a natural burning. Right. Right? And, 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 and you know, also by like coping skills or stress management. Um, 
like, is, you know, is it just because this stuff is like it's hard and it takes time and it doesn't give you an immediate reward? Like what 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 do you find is difficult in getting people in getting your patients to uh, begin to engage with that? For me, it's just I feel like it's people don't even recognize that they need to recognize it. It's just completely it's kind of like the air you breathe. You know, is it polluted? Is it not? Who knows? Depends on where you live. I'm not even gonna think about it because it's just the air that I'm breathing. So that's just the way things are. This is just the amount of stress I have. My life is hard. So that's the amount of stress I have. There's nothing I can do about it. There's nothing that needs to change or can change. And this may apply to multiple areas, but the people around me aren't dealing with it any differently than I am. So I'm not going to either. So for me, having people recognize that something needs to change or that even it can change. There are the other options is the yeah, real sticking I point. I feel that, I that the most common thing that I hear is I just need to relax, but there's no actual description of what that mm. means. And it usually involves being away from people and like watching TV by yourself instead of doing like, well, getting out in nature or getting more sunlight or getting more exercise or actually meditating. If you do meditate, what does meditation mean? Do I just clear my mind? I hear that a lot too. I need to clear my mind. And I'm like, that's not what, that's not what mindfulness is. That's not what meditation is. But I think we hear a lot of that. And so it's just this mantra that you hear in your head, clear your mind, relax, clear your head, clear your mind, relax. But nobody really knows what that means. And I don't blame them. I'm not, nobody's been taught what that means. There's no realistic expectation that we should know what that means because we just hear those words and we're, expected to apply them to be happier and more calm. Yeah, this is a problem with pop culture, right? We've got a lot of headlights and headlights, headlines mm -hmm. and sound bites out there without any depth to it. And that's how people are mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to live their entire life. Or at least in terms of stress, you're right. At least there's stuff mm -hmm. out there like headspace and, you know, they've got a free section. So I'll, I'll refer people to that in the ED and then if people are actually our patients, then we actually have a mindfulness course that we offer and love to go through with people. And then we get into the actual details of what mm -hmm. is this step by step. Mm -hmm. And at this point, I take those things for granted. And it's just really nice to be reminded of how important each step is. For example, simply being aware of what's going on, recognizing when you are feeling a certain way or when you are reacting in a certain way. When you just pay attention to the air and realize, oh, hmm. that smells nice <laughs> and clean or what, what something is burning. Oh boy. Uh, it gives you, well, imagine how difficult it is when people say that. you have to relax and then telling you that relaxation actually takes work <laughs> and it's like, not just going to happen to you or, well, how much, you know, part of mindfulness is being non-judgmental. Being non-judgmental is really hard <laughs> and it's work. To be non-judgmental and, and being like, so in order to do the thing that's yeah. making you calm, I have to do the thing that's very difficult. I, just, I think it's just, people don't really understand that that is part of the process. Mm. Yeah. There's yeah. so much judgment with being non-judgmental, self-judgment too. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm doing so badly. I made a judgment. <laughs> no, you, go, you jump into some mental hall of mirrors. Get down right on yourself for that. Exactly. So what, what do, stuck what do you tell people? How do you, how, how might you so set someone off? Who's so like, you know, the way I relax is I sit down in front of the TV or I drink or I, I smoke pot. No, I was going to say, actually, I want you to take this one because you, you're go ahead. Sagar is probably our group mindfulness <laughs> expert. So I, I usually like to defer to him on these. <laughs> I don't know if that was an oxymoron or not, but, <laughs> but I mean, for me, it depends on what setting. If it's the, if it's the emergency department, I'm trying to work with somebody in several seconds to a minute. I'll just focus on breathing with them. And I'll say, I want you to breathe mm. like this. I'll be back in 15 minutes and we'll see how you're doing. <laughs> Let me turn off the lights for you. Um, so what might, what might and that? And other stuff is going on. And what, what might that breathing Hopefully it doesn't like? time up at the same time. What, what, she's getting stabbed. Specifically. So I really like the, depending on what I think the patient can do, I'll either give them just the simple instructions of inhale through your nose and then breathe out and make sure breathing out takes a lot longer. <laughs> or I might try something with actual seconds countings or, you know, inhale for four whole seconds, then hold it in you for seven whole seconds and breathe it out over eight seconds. And then do that again. I want you to do that 10 times and then do that whole thing three times in a row and see how you feel. Mm. If I'm not back yet, 
Try to keep going if you can. <laughs> oh, I feel very calm. You have a great voice for that. <laughs> Doesn't he? That's what I always say. <laughs> <laughs> so as I'm rapidly saying it and then jumping out the door to go see somebody else. Yeah. And ignore the screaming you hear down the hall. Okay. That has nothing to do with you. <laughs> um, so tell me about the mindfulness course. Is that something, you know, like a John Kabat-Zinn thing or a guy, something that you guys have developed? So it is both. So we've taken something that was developed by some psychologists and made it our own, which, um, so we put a little smear of medicine in there and uh, some extra anatomy and some extra personal experiences as well. And we offered in two different ways. One is a solo way that somebody can just work through it on their own. Uh, and they're forced to only have to listen to me and Zach for so often. And then they get to work through a workbook. But then we also do a workshop course that when people sign up, they do the same thing. But in addition, me and Nina, Zach's wife, will actually talk with them, conversate with them, um, do a workshop and kind of work through the problems that they're experiencing. What are they noticing? What's helpful? What's not helpful? Um, mm. Where can they this, go? Um, like in groups, there? like the people, do they see each other? Yes. Good point. They do see each other. Yep. And everyone is sworn to secrecy. But everyone does see each other and talks to each other mm -hmm. and can uh -huh. relate to each other. Do you find that that, back that, that, that helps people? Because I always thought that, you know, one on one coaching was the gold standard. And then I did groups for, you know, people who couldn't afford one on one. And I, I discovered that the groups often did better or at least as well. And I started, you know, offering group to my one on one clients so that they would do as well. Do you, do you notice the a group dynamic supporting people in their changes? Absolutely. Yeah. People going, Hey, you know, that happened to me too. Or, Oh, I never mm. thought of that. What did you do about that? And just the asking of questions and learning from each other and realizing, Oh, I'm not alone. We're all trying to figure this out is well, there's no incredibly important and useful academia for experience. I mean, there's no, I mean, Sagar and I are not going to be the end all be all on life. You know, we can tell you the data and how things have worked, but when you hear other people going through similar things in the actual sense of community, you, you can't replace that with anecdotes and teaching. Yeah. There's an empathy that happens that uh, accelerates people's willingness you guys to find try things. You, your own lives are different because you are doing this for other people. Like I was, I was looking, I was looking through the, like the Costco connection oh, 100%. that we get and it was an article by a pharmacist and it had his photo and he looked just like on death's door, like, like really like, like an obese face, oh. you know, red, like just like extremely unhealthy. And I think like, that's not uncommon for medical professionals, especially nurses, but also a lot of doctors. And I wonder if you, you know, if you guys for, feel like both for, oh, yeah. um, integrity, but also for sort of, you know, empathy and experience that you have to live up to a certain set of standards. Yeah, I feel like I have to model what I tell people. And thank goodness, because it's made my life better. It's forced me to put effort in the right places in my life uh, on the right, I mean, not the right people, but the people in my life, and then uh, <laughs> eat better, move better, I actually have to do what I say. <laughs> And it's fantastic. And my wife has said, even if your clinic fails, all of this is for nothing. I'm so glad you're doing it because it's making everything better. I mean, my diet think, was Zach? already cleaned up by my wife. It was a little bit stricter than I probably would have preferred at first. Um, and I've always loved exercising. So that's a, I shouldn't say I love it. I've always exercised even when I've hated exercising. Uh, yeah, but I, it, I don't always Which is like every it. Day. <laughs> um, and that's another thing that I like to tell my patients. So you're not, some of this is hard. I mean, a lot of the stuff like, yeah, I don't, I don't like doing it sometimes. I don't like waking up before a, you know, a seven o'clock shift and going for a run. Sometimes it's hard. I don't, I'd, I'd love to sleep in. Granted, sleeping is important to be clear, <laughs> but, um, you know, you get the point. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. We didn't talk about that, um, but yes, I'm so glad you yeah, mentioned that. <laughs> you know, I think that whether it's changed me, I don't, I don't know if I can say that, but I think that it's, um, I think I've already focused on a lot of these things and 
it's given me a little bit more of a sense of, okay, I think I know what I'm doing with, with how to handle all, all of this stuff. Cause I've always tried to live healthy. Uh, I just didn't necessarily know how to target all of that. And, um, I think the biggest one that I was missing was probably my diet prior to Nina making me go whole food plant-based. And now that she ruined that, my only outlet, I have to <laughs> doing that. That's true. You can always start just habit. every time I get you know, mad, just... I'll throw something in the wall <laughs> around here or something. It'll work. I'm, I'm sure someone has a, there you go. I'm sure someone has a study yeah. saying that'll help you live longer. It's cathartic. Yeah. I'll write the study. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is one of the key parts of reviewing an article: conflicts so, of interest. Uh, sleep is important. We haven't talked about sleep. What do you, what do you what do you see in the, in in your patients? Oh my gosh, so many patients uh, have it upside down mm -hmm. for a lot. Sleep comes last, and they want to make progress in the other areas of life. For example, weight loss or exercise. And for some of them, I say, okay, we've been trying it this way. We're making some progress. Let's try flipping this upside down and actually working on your sleep first, because four hours a night is really just much too short. This chronic well, insomnia yeah. is and they're destroying you. It's destroying your will <laughs> and they get to go on, from work in their decision so making, you to work all out. sorts of things. Yeah, like, I know. Because you've been sleeping for four hours a night. It's weird. <laughs> so why uh, why are they sleeping four hours a night? What are some of the inputs oh. that that cause that? TV is huge as is the phone, as is, and here's a hard one, time with the spouse, right? If there's a spouse that's involved um, and maybe you work different shifts, maybe this is the time that you can connect with your spouse after the kids go to bed, but then you gotta stay awake. And then you gotta wake up early because that's when work happens. That's a tough one. Or a lot of the times um, there's something going on if it, as, you know, self-medicating, be it with alcohol and that's the time to do it, or it's with television and something happening on the iPhone or tablet that is acting as self-medication to calm their stress because they don't have another different well, or, coping mechanism. And even coming back to some of their stuff with like the mindfulness that, and trying to you know the amount of calm and stress that that gets rid or the calm that it brings in the stress release that it, that it causes when you're carrying all that stuff to the bed at night. And like, that's now your time to process all of your stresses while you're lying in bed, staring at your ceiling, not a great time for it. And then when you're sleeping, you're waking up and getting bad sleep. Your cortisol spikes at three o'clock in the morning. People are like, why am I waking up at three o'clock in the morning? It's like, oh, it's probably because you're stressed. Mm. Uh, it, Nina tells us all the time when she has patients that wake up in the middle of the night, she goes, is it three o'clock in the morning? And they go, yes. How did you know that? Yeah. And she's like, because it's, it's circadian. Like this is just what people do. Um, <laughs> so what, so yeah, what, what is it? What is it about three o'clock? It's typically when your body's starting to rev itself up, your cycle's starting to get ready, um, and your cortisol starts to spike, so your stress hormones that are normal to fluctuate. But if you have an over-aggressive response because you're not coping with stress, it'll wake you up, and you're just ready to go, and you're amped, and you're like, okay, now I can't sleep. Mm. So this is, this is... Yeah. And that's for yeah, people who are on a normal normal rhythm. If you're a night owl or a early bird, so it seems like everything's sort a of a moving time. target, right? So you say, well, let's not target weight loss mm -hmm. or exercise because let's target sleep. But when we target sleep, <clears throat> then we realize it's actually stress. Mm -hmm. And then, and then we, yeah, you know, we could look at stress and say, well, you know, your diet is really causing you a lot of stress physiologically. And then, uh -huh. right. so do do you uh -huh. have do you have and then, like protocols for like where to begin, or you leave it up to people, or you kind of have them, you know, do multi pronged shift changes so i leave it up to people once we have thoroughly investigated things on where it's coming from and trying to figure out okay what is actually your one area that you want to hit first and sometimes it's the most impactful area that we've figured out and sometimes it's just the easiest area you know sometimes it's easier just to start a workout plan or a walk and everything else is just much too hard to deal with, but at least they can start doing something. Okay. We got one thing going. Other times we realize that, oh, sleep is the thing. Sleep is the thing. So we got to start working on, you know, what time you go into bed. But if we figure out sleep is the thing because stress is the thing, then we start working on stress and it is all moving parts and they're all related to each other and they're all feeding into each other, which makes it a little complicated. And it's kind of mm -hmm. nice to talk it out with someone. Yeah. I think you have to get them who to can realize put that it together. these things are interconnected. If they just think like you were saying, you know, that the problem is weight loss 
and it's simply weight loss. It's not my diet. It's not my exercise. It's not my sleep. I just need to lose weight. And you're like, well, how are we going to do that without addressing some of these things? But you have to get them to you know, <laughs> realize that, yeah, all these things are interconnected. Let's focus on the things that are, like you said, the most impactful, the simplest things first. Mm. So what, one of the digs around the early days of lifestyle medicine was that it sounded like you were blaming the patient, right? Because like, well, you if you can fix this, then you must have caused it, right? Do, do, you, do you have language for helping people feel like, you know, you're not victim blaming? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> and so the, the facts of that are true. So, which is, yeah, you have this, your lifestyle integral to causing it, but I like to frame it in more of a way of, guess what? You're in charge. And so, you know, you didn't know this stuff was going on. You had no idea. Mm -hmm. So how, if you didn't know any better, how could you do any better? But now we're going to start figuring out stuff. We're going to start teaching you more. You're realizing all this power you have. And now that you have the realization and you have mm -hmm. the tools. I'll watch yeah, out. Yeah, I think There's a potential. lot of it is letting people. What do you want to do with it? I don't want to say shifting blame, but so much as letting them say, like, how, kind of we're talking about before, how is it that you would have known any of these things? When you try to search what's a good diet online, you get 15 different recommendations and, you know, 13 of them are total garbage. Or you're told, you know, sleep is for the weak. <laughs> and, you know, if you can stay up all the time and, and you can get more stuff done. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, you're told that it's normal to work 45 hours a week, still come home, take care of the house, take care of the kids still make sure you catch up on your, your Netflix TV shows and you're supposed to have time to work out. Like you, the idea of control becomes really important because these people I think have a sense that they have control, but really they've given up all their control to external forces in life. Where if you say, these are things that we can cut out really easily that are causing you stress or eating up your time or whatever. And we can start focusing on this. It makes it a lot easier. So they go, okay, if I meal prep on Sunday, I don't have to eat three hungry mans this week. Uh, you know, and all of a sudden their diet's that much better. You, you just fix their dinner three nights out of you know half the nights out of the week with with a simple thing. Mm. Uh, so I think that if you're you're right, a lot of the things are decisions that we've made, but we're making these decisions under the pretense that we're in a society that values things that have not been health healthy lifestyle choices. I guess. Mm. Yeah, I mean that's the other thing that I'm I'm thinking is that you know you told me going back to the unmedicated, you know, medicated blood pressure being the same as people with normal blood pressure. If you give someone a blood pressure pill, you're probably not going to like materially change the, the quality of their existence. But I'm imagining that when you help people with exercise, with eating right, with, with coping mechanisms, with starting to take control, that it's not, it's not just a health outcome that you can measure with with devices that there's there's quality of life that people become happier more you know have more agency over their lives get to start making other decisions that they didn't have control over do you guys see any of that yeah I and mean, we talk about this all the time i mean in the healthcare field a lot of times we can keep you alive till you're 75 80 85 with relative frequency um but the question I think most of us want to answer is, are we going to be alive and healthy until we're 75, 80, 85? I don't know if it does much good if you're 85 years old and you can't get out of bed or you're living in a nursing home or you're, you have dementia and you can't communicate with people you love. But if we can get you to 85 and you're active and you're able to walk around outside and take care of your, yourself and live on your own, the difference between taking a bunch of medications that keep your heart from infarcting versus having a lifestyle that keeps your heart actually strong and your limbs strong and your blood flow good and your, your brain still functioning. It's a lot different. You know, the, people I think have this idea that if I eat a big Mac a day and I smoke a bunch of cigarettes, I don't care if I die of a heart attack, no big deal. You're like, okay, that's fine. Valid. I'll give that. That's a fair point. If you, if that, those things add value to your life, enjoy to your life, then who am I to say that they don't? However, usually what happens is not, you just have a heart attack and die. You have a heart attack, you survive but you had a stroke during that heart attack, or you just have a stroke, or you get peripheral vascular disease and you get an amputation and now you're on dialysis because your kidneys failed in the meantime. It's not a stepwise, you know, major step down, you die. It's this slow decline with all of these things that are adding up. And now your life's kind of miserable when all we had to do, I shouldn't say all we had to do, but the things that we could have done to make your life better were better than just the medicines would have done alone. Yeah. People think and I, I use this example frequently, but people think that life is an on off switch that they can do whatever they want and it doesn't matter how bad it is for them because mm -hmm. they're just going to die 
and that'll be it. And they got to live all their happy years as the on part of the switch until they died and it was off. But life is a dimmer switch. And the more crud you do to yourself, the more unhealthfully you live, the dimmer and dimmer and dimmer your life gets until, you know, for the last several mm -hmm. years or longer, you're just, it's barely on at all. Mm -hmm. And it's horrendous. I've seen people frequently who spend most of their days in the hospital or in their doctor's office or in a laboratory getting tested. And this is their life where they live in a nursing home and they are not happy there. There are some nursing homes and people are happy there and good for them. But a lot of people are miserable. Yeah. And most people's just, retirement plan is not to retire to their nearest nursing home. Mm -hmm. It's to, you know, travel and spend time with grandkids and family and do the things that you've always wanted to do. So let, let, let's end. I want to hear about your, your podcast. Like what, what are the plans for it? What, um, what are the topics you want to cover? How, how do you want, how do you want your listeners to respond? By the way, if anyone wants to come listen to us, uh, argue with each other and say things that we think are helpful, it's called CPR for life. And, uh, that's on any podcast distributing place, or you can come to our website at CPR health. So wait, I want to interrupt you. What, link right in. what is, what is CPR is mean here? trying to describe all these things. Oh, all right. Yeah, great point. We're so, Columbus we're prevent so and clever. Lever. We're such a we're a clever. We group. live in Columbus. <laughs> we are. <laughs> Bringing back that life to the proper on position. Okay, yes, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So our purpose is to try and describe all these things to people um, so they can better understand it. So we've gone through and the first phase was going through these pillars of health, these pillars of lifestyle intervention and change like exercise and eating right and um, stress and help people understand, oh, oh, these are powerful tools and techniques that I have access to. Okay. And now what we're going to unroll in a little while is a disease by disease application of those things. We'll go into high blood pressure. Okay. What is it? What does it mean? Why do you have it? What can you do about it without meds? What meds are you actually on and how do they work? Just so you know what the medical community is doing, why we're doing that and what you can do to supplement that or even get rid of your meds. If you do it really well, it is possible. And then we'll go into diabetes and just bit by bit, helping people understand what they're afflicted with and what they can do about it and why do you, do you keep uh, other physicians in mind as a potential audience? So our main person that we're talking to is the person who has found themselves in the state where they are not happy with their health and they're frustrated and they're trying to look for scientific evidence-based ways of retaking control. Hopefully there's some doctors out there too, listening and going, Oh, well, that's pretty cool. Oh, I could tell my patient about these other things they can do, but Really, it's for the person themselves. Cool. And no, I think that's pretty well that, described. That's, like after that? I, no, I agree that we don't really focus on talking to the docs too much, but I think it would be a good place for docs to... I, I think that I would learn something listening to. I learned something reading about it and talking to you about it. So I think that certainly um, healthcare providers in general would, would benefit from it. Sweet. Well, it's a CPR for life available on all the podcast platforms. And if, uh, so you're doing telemedicine, does that, does that mean anyone can see you or it still has to be in Ohio? Is this going to change? It seems so insane. State of Ohio, that, Ohio wide. That, that <laughs> there's still statewide. You have to be boarded in each state or. Yeah. It's pretty cool. <laughs> no, me neither. Yeah. I don't see that changing anytime soon. Yeah. The state <laughs> boards of medicine make a decent amount of money, making sure that you spend a lot of money getting boarded in each state. So yeah, you'd have to go through each individual state. I see. Okay. They, they suspended that for a bit during COVID. Uh, yeah. I know that in certain states they were making getting boarded much easier, but I don't know if that's still going on. I don't think so. All right. So the Buckeyes get to get to work with you and uh, everyone else can just go, go to ACLM. Dot, uh, That's which right. is lifestylemedicine.org and they can search for a uh, provider who can. Yep. And they mm -hmm. can search for. Awesome. Do you guys have um, theme music for your podcast? And we have a song, but it's not, you know, it's just grabbed from, from epidemic sound. It's not like a, like a well-known song or anything. Epid <laughs> I wish it was. It'd be cool. Epidemic sound. Yeah. It's a, it's a music platform for like, um, 
like YouTubers and, and bloggers and uh, and podcasters. Okay, I thought it might. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. I didn't realize yeah, that was true. I didn't think about from. that. How <laughs> yeah, hypertension music. <laughs> cool. Well, <laughs> um, I, I, so like, like, yeah. I think you're offering a unique voice in in the space with both with you know the the humility combined with the the repartee and sense of humor it's very you know it's an easy pill to swallow and uh it's it's trustworthy so i'm so glad you guys are doing it and it was such an honor to to talk to you about it today any final thoughts or words for folks and say that people are in control of almost everything about their health. So take heart in that. Oh, and before we go, yeah. the, um, the web address for people in Ohio who want to find out about your practice, where, where do they go? CPRHealthClinic.com. Right, I'm make a note of that. CPRHealthClinic.com. Zach, did you have any Thanks. final thoughts? No, I just want to echo, I guess, what Sagra said, that even, even if it's something like, you know, cancer or an autoimmune disease that you were just unlucky enough to have your lifestyle can still affect that it may not cure it but it can still affect it and the things that you do will still matter awesome all right well on that uh, hopeful yeah. and positive feel note, a difference i will bid you guys adieu thank you so much for for all you do and for taking the time today thanks Howie. appreciate yeah. it take care well, thank you very much for having us appreciate it <laughs>